the Quinn administration reaches a deal with the largest state workers union and the House debates guns and pensions. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state government, sometimes the federal government, and how it just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg with the State Journal Register. It's been a busy week over at the State House, and then we've got the federal sequester. We really will talk about the federal government today. <laughs> um, with me today, a couple of folks who watch all this stuff, and glad to have them with me. Bob Goff is back. He is editor of QuincyJournal.com and news director at WTAD AM News in Quincy. Radio, correct? correct? Good to be back, thanks. Nice to see you. And Kent Redfield is back, Professor Emeritus, Political Science, UIS. I don't really believe the Emeritus because he's everywhere. <laughs> Kent, welcome back. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, uh, the shocking news hit late in the week that uh, after talk of a state government strike perhaps of you know 50,000 employees or maybe 40 uh, of AFSCME, American Federation of State County Municipal Employees and the Quinn administration and they all have been battling wildly for a long time and, and negotiated for more than a year and that they've reached a tentative agreement. So Kent, being one of the, I, were you AFSCME? Uh, no, never AFSCME. Okay, me. never yeah. AFSCME. Yeah. But uh, tell me, uh, what does this portend? What, what do you hear? Well, if it all, and we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Because so it has to be approved. Assuming it's ratified, then having le labor peace is a big deal. Now, whether that's, you know, it's going to be at what cost, and, 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 and that's the more interesting things are exactly what are the terms and, and how does this stretch out. But uh, it, it means that we're not going to have a strike, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, it also takes something off the table in terms of the governor, in terms of him setting up for re-election. It's not unimportant to have a sense that you know government is functioning if if you're the yeah. chief executive and so uh, potentially it's it's a big deal. Uh, we'll see whether or not uh, the legislature will agree to fund it, which was a problem with the last contract, and we'll see how the details work out on things like uh, retiree health care and some other things that uh, are still part of the you know the budget crisis, but they also morph over into the pension crisis. Yeah. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the devil will be in the details on this. Uh, you know, we had uh, the, the situation in Quincy where we had the picketers out and, you know, when they have their marches and everything to, to try to drive their point home. And I want to know what the ripple effect is going to be that if this indeed does pass, will other state unions and other unions who uh, work in, in other forms of government across the state will use this as some kind of barometer? Will this be the baseline for their own and future negotiations? Mm -hmm. I know we have a lot of negotiations coming up uh, in Quincy and Adams County, and I think it's something that those unions will of course be paying attention to. I, I think it's interesting. I mean, even uh, last summer at the state fair, I know uh, unions, I think it was asked me, wasn't it, that was right. showed up in force when Governor Quinn was giving his speech. And it's been a very confrontational thing. Ob and obviously, uh, with the legislature not yet settled on a plan to reform the pension system, which basically means re employees will have to either pay more or get less or both, um, you know, there are still some contentious issues out there. Do again, I, I think Kent, you mentioned it a little that this shows at least some normalcy in government. Mm -hmm. But you know, the Quinn administration, Pat Quinn, the governor, has been very unpopular with the unions, even though he's a Democratic governor. How much has this changed with this? Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I right. mean, there, there's not the thing that's at striking. First of all, is there don't seem to be significant givebacks, and that's what was the bone of contention: was that we were doing things that would end up with uh, either actual pay or pay plus health care going down. And the details as we know them talk a little bit about some step increases and some cost of living things and kind of the health care to be done later. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but it's unlikely the union would have agreed to it uh, if there would have been significant givebacks. And so that's that's the real change that's surprising is that we're not trying to get things out of ASME in terms of the overall budget situation if we're just kind of adopting kind of a status quo, hold the line kind of an approach. Yeah, and it will be kind of interesting to see over time what this does to budgeting. I mean, we do have 
the still temporary uh, increase in the state income tax that passed, what, at the end of 11, was it? Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to start coming off in, I think, 14. Uh, so uh, I don't know if, you know, whatever's in the contract can be paid without an extension of that tax, but nobody has said that I've heard that, you know, there's any determination of that. Well, um, there's been some discussion in, in several of the proposals that have uh, been discussed recently uh, about eliminating the sunset, that the tax would become permanent. So I think that's going to happen. Anybody that thought this was going to be in place without it eventually becoming permanent. Was oh, you're, you're saying the tax will be permanent? Oh, absolutely. No yeah. doubt about Well, this will be, of course, a big issue in the <laughs> next election right. also of, of uh, 14 for any candidate running. So well, I think didn't Lang in his latest proposal call for it to be? I believe he, he did. Yeah, that was a, uh, a pension a pension proposal, right? right. And, uh, and, Lou Lang, state representative from Skokie, right. and, near and my old neighborhood. You always have yeah. to look at you know the election calendar, and so you know if we're talking about new money in the second and third year of the contract that kind of gets you past 2014, and the tax increase gets you past 2014, and and so I, I'm sure there are those kinds of things going on. Now, whether this means that. Ask me is going to sign on to, uh, you know, the Quinn campaign next spring. I, I think that's still pretty unlikely. But it, it, you, know, you never know it, it. You know who else is running. But that's right. And yeah, we don't yet know if he's challenged in the primary or not. Again, you know, right. we've had the talk of Lisa Madigan, the Attorney General, possibly running for governor uh, on the Democratic side. Bill Daly, we haven't heard from him lately. The uh, former mayor's a brother and son of former mayors of Chicago. Right. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Um, let's let's move to pensions. It's obviously a a big issue in Springfield and anywhere there are state employees. There was a new proposal put out this week uh, as part of the process. Uh, Tom Cross, the House Republican leader, Elaine Neckritz, a Democratic member of the legislature from uh, the suburbs. Daniel Biss, uh, state senator, Democrat from Evanston, were among the people talking at the press conference. And I know part of it is for new employees over time of universities and school districts, there would actually be a, a, a third tier of pensions where those institutions if I'm getting this right, would pick up the pensions of those people in the future. Right. That wouldn't change people who are already employed and under like the teacher's retirement system now. But as Tom Cross said, that that lowers the eventual pension liability greatly because what that means is over a period of time, a generation or two, uh, the state would be, get out of the teacher's retirement system business. Local school districts would pay their teachers, p donate to their pensions, and, and pay their pensions. Any, uh, there was some agreement that this might mm. be, uh, or some talk that this might be a palatable plan to some, although there are certainly constitutional questions about other parts of it. It's Bob? certainly more palatable than the status quo, which uh, you know has encouraged the school districts, the downstate school districts, for years to take retiring teachers who are making, say, sixty thousand dollars, give them a pension sweetener, send them on their way. Yeah, they they, always, they, the they hire a thirty thousand dollar teacher, so they save the money. But then that sixty thousand dollar pension is magically passed on to the state. Right. So whoever devised this plan in the first place, I don't know how they ever thought it was going to work. Uh, eventually, they, it sounds like local school districts might have had something to do with that. Yeah, they yes. probably did lobby to get this. No doubt about <laughs> and, it. And of course, and of course, and you know, and obviously, people would argue the unions and because it's a it is a good deal. And anyway, go ahead. And and full disclosure, my wife is a member of TRS, and she's got about twenty years in. So and uh, so you know, I pay a lot of attention. To these and that things. means you can continue to be a reporter. Go ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think that uh, you know, eventually, the cost shift's going to happen. It's going to be a tough pill to swallow, but when you talk about these local school districts eventually taking on the pensions for the future teachers, it has to happen. The school district is going to have to have some sort of responsibility, and I've always, I've been saying for, for months now that what the school, what the state legislature is going to do, you know, as part of your levy, the, the say if it's $4 for your, that includes your tort levy, that includes your special ed levy, that includes all that, they will create a pension levy. That will be part of that. Of property taxes. Pro out of property taxes. <laughs> Taxes. That's where it's going to come from. And they'll allow the school districts to set a baseline for it. And then if the school districts need to raise that for, from a nickel to a dime or what have you, then the school districts will have to go to the voters to get that done. Right. That's, that's going to be the way that this eventually is going to happen. I've just got to say, though, anybody that votes for that is going to be, a, I mean, mm. that's a difficult vote to, to pass on to your folks because everybody runs saying, I don't want to raise your property taxes. But, the, you know, there's no, I think there's going to be enough, in the, in, you can do that because there's going to be enough votes uh, in the legislature by the Democrats that the, the probably it's going to be mostly a downstate issue. And then the Chicago, it, so I think the Chicago uh, uh, Democrats will be able to, and the suburban Democrats will be able to, to send this on down to the 
to the to the downstaters. Okay, well, interestingly, and of course there are some Democrats sprinkled throughout downstate sure, as well. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Can yeah, it, it, it is, we're talking about at least what looks like the cost shift out of the latest Neckert's cross, cross yeah. bill is on new hires. And that right. is, so we're really getting, this is just the camel's nose under the tent, right. sort of <laughs> slow sort of thing. Once you establish the principle, and you know, five years from now, we're not making enough progress, we've got a little more cost shift, then you know, you've already gone down that road a little bit. So this is probably, you know, it, it doesn't get you the kind of savings that an immediate cost shift does, which right. is takes all of the operating costs of pensions on an annual basis, gives it to the local uh, units, and therefore uh, the state's got more money to mm -hmm. pay down pension debt or do whatever else the state does with, uh, with money. So uh, that part of it's interesting. Uh, they've got another tier in there that's a combining uh, a, a deferred compensation and a deferred benefit kind of hybrid sort of thing. Right, like a 401k with something. Yeah, and that's, those are actually interesting proposals. Mm -hmm. And going forward, it's going to be difficult to kind of, if we've got three tiers and we're trying to figure out actuarially what we're doing, it might get a, a little complicated. Right. The, the elephant in the room is still what's constitutional when right. you get to COLAs, and that's really where the money is. If, if, in if the you, cost of living increases, which are now 3% yes. yeah. an, annually compounded, and w which is really costing the state yeah. a lot for the long time retiring. And this asserts that it's constitutional to have current employees pay more for their retirement and also to limit COLAs for uh, retirees. Current employees pay more, retirees we can limit their COLAs, yeah. and that uh, is going to have to resolve. Yeah, and of course, but our constitution and the problem, the constitutional problem is the state constitution says you can't diminish retirement benefit to people. But right. One thing that the and so, you know, the question is, does that do that? Yeah. But one thing that the Quincy School District has, has recently done is they have voted not to provide the retirement sweeteners anymore. They said at the end of the current school district's fiscal year, there, that's it. So I believe the Quincy School District is probably going to have a pretty good rush of teachers who will retire and administrators right. who will retire this year in order to take advantage of it because it's going to be gone after July. Yeah. I, so. I learned a little about this myself because I recently did a story about Sue Scher, who's the new right. state representative from mm -hmm. Decatur, mm -hmm. who also represents part of Springfield, and she was a teacher for more than 30 years, but. She signed a letter like four years ago that I'm going to retire in four years that she got from the school district a 6% yep. increase each year. Yes. She got like 180 extra days of vacation yep. time given to her so she could use and, and base her retirement on that. And she actually, once she won election, she did retire, you know, and is getting like 60,000 a year as, as a uh, retired teacher. And that's all legal and it's all right. fine. But she's also one of the people who said, I don't want any cost shift to the school districts because they can't afford it because property taxes are already too high. So you, you, you see where the, some of oh this yeah, problem yeah, comes absolutely. in. And if, if the district would have gone above the 6%, they would have been liable for the increased uh, the burden on costs, the pension right, system. Right, right. And, and that 6% became, um, you know, a floor rather than a ceiling. Right. And so uh, that's, or whatever the, the correct way to, to say that is. And that may get revisited is if, if we, in terms of trying to, if, if we see it going out. Right. And when you have more people retire, that screws up your actuarial assumptions. And so this is really kind of a moving target in terms of where we, we need to, to get. But uh, I don't know that we resolved anything today with kind of voting on draconian amendments that oh, we uh, did. Oh, Speaker on Madigan had a day yeah. as we taped the show of, <laughs> of uh, yeah, debate in the House. I just stopped in for a minute and Dennis Rebelletti, one of the Republicans, was yelling about how unfair the process was. <laughs> so uh, a typical day at the races with our legislature. Yeah, it, it essentially was, you know, an up or down vote. You want everybody to retire at 67. And of course, you know, everybody. You can't vote for that and then no, get elected you, again. And the Republicans yeah. were refusing to play because they were mostly, mostly voting present. Mm -hmm. Whereas, the, you know, everybody that needed to be on the roll call against cutting retirement ages, you know, is now on the roll call. So I, I'm not sure, you know, it, it accomplished a little bit, I guess, if we're kind of moving along on their argument. But. Uh, I don't know that it's, uh, I, I thought probably what was done with concealed carry earlier in the week yeah. may have been more productive. Okay, well, let, uh, w pension is a common theme of <laughs> the show and will continue to be, but let's talk about concealed carry because 
the state, uh, you know, recently uh, there was no rehearing granted by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, federal court in Chicago, where a panel has already ordered the state by June, I think it is, to come up with some form of concealed carry for regular citizens uh, of weapons. We're the last state that doesn't have some sort. And there was a full day that Speaker Madigan in the Illinois House set aside for debate on amendments. There were lots of amendments debated. Um, some of them seemed to conflict, but a lot of them would restrict guns from schools or from shop from different areas. So where, where are we on that, and how productive was that day? Well, it still needs a, a third reading. It had its second reading, and the Amendment 27, I think, was the one that finally passed. But as you said, there are some co some conflicts in there, and uh, you know they have to take care of certain provisions. I thought one of the things that was a bit overreaching was the uh, whole issue of uh, buildings that are adjacent to schools or property that's adjacent to daycares, and mm -hmm. you know to, to kind of you know, keep going, and, and where was that going to stop? And you know some of the legislators brought up uh, so, some interesting scenarios uh, about uh, you know f and uh, you know some of the things that talked about okay if I'm carrying my gun and my wife's pregnant and her water breaks and I have to get to the <laughs> hospital and I pull in the hospital and I've got my gun and it, how's that gonna you know so there's lots of scenarios that they're dreaming up to try to make this work I wish they just take Missouri's law just scratch out Missouri put in Illinois and, say, and what does that one do um, basically you have to pay the permit um, uh, biz any business any private property owner is allowed to opt out out, and I believe they have uh, they have four or five uh, exceptions that are automatics, but other businesses uh, can opt out. It's mm -hmm. it's really pretty simple. And I'm sure that the people who are for gun control are trying to impose as many restrictions as possible. So in reality, you won't be able to carry a gun almost anywhere. Yeah, I think right? uh, Representative Tracy said, you know, it'd be lucky to take them into our own bathrooms at some point. Yeah, this would be uh, Jill Tracy, Jill Tracy from, from Quincy. Yes. Right. Yeah. And there was some there's some value in I, we didn't I don't think moved anybody in terms of changing their opinion. There's some value in having people from Chicago and people from downstate talk to each other about guns because if it wasn't clear before then, it was certainly clear after that debate that people are really living in different worlds and this is not easy to resolve right. kind of the perceptions. And so I there there may have been some value in that. I think it provides some negotiating uh, value for if you've got mass transit gets a big roll call then maybe you can leverage that in terms of a final agreement. Uh, I, would, I don't keep, think yeah. we're going to write legislation on the floor. What That reminded me of the way that the House used to operate back in the, the 70s under Bill Redman. I mean, everybody complained about spending eight hours on one bill. Hearing all the amendments. Hey, hearing yeah. all the amendments. That was every day in the legislature back in the 70s, which is why we don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very inefficient. Well, uh, it still looks like un under court order something will come, some gun legislation yes. will come this summer. We'll kind of have to see. Um, unless some miracle happens by the time the show airs, uh, uh, the, sequest the federal sequester appears to be happening where Congress and the President have not agreed, or basically the two sides in Congress have not agreed uh, on avoiding these, what the President calls draconian cuts. Uh, I know I did a story how uh, FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, towers, there might be a hundred closed at smaller airports around the country. That doesn't necessarily close airports. We can talk about that, Bob, because I know Quincy's in an right. interesting situation. But the tower in Springfield that has like 19 employees could close. The airport operates at night now after 10 p.m. without a tower anyway. You can operate an airport without a tower, but, you know, that it takes away a level of safety, and I think people expect, you know, towers. So anyway, Bob, your thoughts, and, well, uh, and nothing will happen until at least April because the FAA didn't even say which towers would close, right. uh, and they'd have to figure this out. And, and uh, uh, Mark Hanna, who runs the airport in Springfield, said there's so many rules and regulations and routes that everybody ha that are published by the FAA that pilots have to follow that in order to make a change like that there would have to be a whole series of changes and a lot of planning none of which has come public at this point right Quincy's had an unmanned tower for years um, the, the and you have commercial flights but there. we have yes Cape Air uh, is we have a commuter that goes from uh, Quincy to St. Louis uh, last year uh, they hit a milestone they they had 10,000 flights or ten, not 10,000 flights 10,000 uh, passengers from Quincy to St. Louis that qualified Quincy for one million dollars uh, from the FAA for uh, airport improvements and they've been trying to hit that 10,000 milestone for years and they they'd finally reached that and climb that so uh, so the airport's been in in the news lately uh, anyway because 
because of that. But uh, and, and people, if, uh, they use the airport to get to St. Louis because then once you check in, it's a lot like Springfield's. The parking's free. You can get in there and slide right. down. Go, and go through wherever. security yes. there, and then you're through. Yeah, you, right. you have no a five-person line as opposed to a 50-person line at St. Louis or O'Hare. Um, but I think that, uh, yes, the, the FAA regulations and the sequesters thing they're talking about, Quincy's had an unmanned tower for years, so really don't know if there's going to be any big effect there. And the, of course, the if they close in, like at O'Hare, then, then right then we don't want to close towers at yeah, O'Hare. That's when, a when you look in the sky <laughs> and there's two lines of planes. Yeah. Uh, can, yeah, any thoughts? Uh, you know, the, uh, it's just an, it's an interesting time because we see gridlock in Springfield, but the Washington gridlock is, oh. gridlock is even worse. Yeah, and so it's going to be it, to the advantage of the I mean the Democrats and the and the president particularly. It's kind of the fireman first principle when you get in a budget crisis, you want to put the most dramatic things out there to kind of highlight it. And so right now we're just posturing on both sides, seeing kind of assessing who's, who's going to get the blame and nothing dramatic is going to happen in a month or two months. Down the road, this is an incredibly stupid way to make public policy in terms of across the board cuts. And uh, there are certainly things in, on both the, mili the domestic and the, and, the, uh, and the defense side we shouldn't be doing. But uh, there are times when the, the General Assembly actually, you know, looks like a model of efficiency and rationality <laughs> compared which is, which to the... Is interesting to say. Yeah, compared to, to Congress. So. What, what, uh, which makes for a good transition for me because it, uh, Aaron Schock, a congressman from Peoria who represents part of Springfield, used to be in the Illinois House. Now he's in Congress. He's considering running for governor. Um, which is interesting because there's a kind of a bigger field of uh, Republicans. And he says, if you want to see how things shouldn't work, look at Illinois. You know, he says mm -hmm. this from the congressional side, but of course he says he's doing fine in Congress. Um, interesting, uh, Bob, uh, uh, Mr. Schock has come under attack in various ads over a fiscal cliff vote that he says didn't raise taxes because they had, you know, gone up at midnight that night, so they voted him back down. But every, a lot of people look at it and say that it, it was an increase. Uh, and so there's like a more than a million dollars in ads running against him from some group we're not sure of the right. source. They've blamed Bruce Rauner, who's a bil about a billionaire from Chicago, who also wants to run for governor on the Republican side, who denies having anything to do with those ads. And now the Club for Growth, which is a kind of well-known conservative group that basically fights excessive government spending, they've put shock on a list saying we want people to find somebody to run against him in a primary. What's going on? <laughs> and Adam Kinzinger's on that list too. Yeah, who's a new, uh, yeah, who's a second term congressman. Right, from, who's up from, um, from the suburbs as well. Or he's from the suburbs, of course. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, he was in Quincy this past weekend. He uh, headlined a fundraiser for uh, Republican mayoral candidate Kyle Moore. And then he spoke at the Adams County Lincoln Reagan days. And, uh, you know, what he said, you know, he, he kind of, he blasted, Ro Ronner spoke, Ronner left, and then Kinzinger blasted Ronner and said, I would say this to his face if he were here. Uh, blasting him for blaming him basically for the for the first round of the of the anti-shock anti -shock ads, ads, which of course again Ronner Ronner has denied. Yes, but absolutely. What are you going to do? Yeah, so the, so you know the, you've got a lot of infighting here, and you know the the word rhinos thrown around a lot by conservatives. Republican and, in re name only. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so that's and and uh, and both shock and and who was never considered one before is now sort of getting hung with that label, uh, as is Kinzinger because they both scored pretty low on the Club for Growth scale, and they are two of their targets. So which is so which is interesting because both run as conservatives. Both run as and conservatives Kinsinger and was kind of wasn't he, wasn't Kinsinger considered a Tea Party absolutely. darling when he right. got in yeah. like yeah. two years ago and, and, and beat Ma Manzullo, who was more the kind of more the established establishment Republican candidate. and had been yeah. in for twenty years and, from and, the Rockford and, area. And yeah. Shock hasn't had a serious challenge yet. Matter of fact, the district, the eighteenth district, was kind of drawn for him. So it's because very he's, Republican, he's yes. got a very heavy base. He's got a good base in Adams County. Right. He has some family in Quincy. So you you look at this and, and to see them coming after him now. I mean, if, if he wasn't running for governor or considering a gubernatorial run, I think they'd have left him alone. But I think this is really starting to draw a little bit of fire for him. It, it's an interesting time. So we'll see where it goes. Because other candidates, potential Republican candidates for governor, still include Bill Brady from mm -hmm. Bloomington, represents part of Springfield, state senator, uh, who was the nominee last time. Uh, and uh, Kirk Dillard, uh, state senator uh, from Hinsdale, who, you know, uh, former, was it chief of staff to uh, Jim Edgar? Jim Edgar? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And also mm -hmm. worked for Jim Thompson administration. So we'll Treasure see where Dan that one Rutherford, goes. another one as Treasure well. Treasurer Dan Rutherford, that's right. I'm running, Chinoa, but I'm not ready to announce yet. Living so. <laughs> he, yes, and putting his entire life on Facebook. Well, at least what he <laughs> ate for breakfast, but we'll see where it goes. Um, 
Another thing that's happening, there has now been a meeting set for April 9th uh, of the Republican State Central Committee where they are considering ouster of Pat Brady, who is actually grew up in Bloomington where Brady is from, but they're not related, and he lives in St. Charles. Uh, and he's chairman of the Republican Party, but he made calls on behalf of same-sex marriage and tried to get some Republican votes for that. Some Republicans, including Jim Oberweiss, a new state senator, are very upset with him, and, are, and that is at least one reason People say there's other reasons, too, about how the party's operating. They might try to get him out in a meeting that is now set for April 9th. Last I heard, it was in Tinley Park. Uh, is this good for the party? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and, and, what will, and any idea what will happen with that? I, 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 I'm not close enough to really be able to, to, to count votes. I mean, clearly the Republicans had a bad year uh, in, in 2012, in 2012 and, right. and there might be all kinds of reasons to question uh, Brady's leadership. On the other hand, this has become, whether justified or not, has been portrayed as kind of the hardline social conservatives going after Brady over same-sex marriage, and and that's when the Republican Party is trying to rebrand itself and to be a, a more moderate. Tent, a bigger tent. Then mm -hmm. uh, this is not well. The some in the Republican Party, some, yeah. and yeah. and that's what's interesting is you've got this group that's trying to move towards some more moderate stances and saying we've got to get a bigger base and then you get the pushback from the club for growth and people like Oberweiss saying we need more purity right. and that's we'll see the, where it goes yeah the democrats are just saying you know can i have hold at your, it yeah, yeah can okay. i hold your coat we're, we're gonna we're gonna have to end it there <laughs> time is out but uh, it's been a, a quick half hour mm -hmm. thank you bob goff kent redfield i'm bernie schoenberg and thank you for watching we'll see you next time on capitol view mm -hmm.